All right. Well, welcome to our science-based webinar tonight. Um, uh, I'm Carrie Cootie, uh, along with um, several other medical providers tonight that you'll, I'll introduce you to as we go along through this webinar. We're really excited to, to get started in sharing this information with you all. And before I do that, I'm just going to make sure that our last panelist can share her screen or turn on her camera, I should say. And I'm going to share my screen and have a PowerPoint. All right. Okay, so here we are. So again, welcome, welcome, welcome. So many of you are very excited to learn more about the science behind essential oils. And I think we've got a great lineup tonight of different medical providers from different backgrounds, different um, specialties, all of those things. And we have a lot of great topics for you. So I'm going to dive right in. I'm going to introduce our first speaker tonight, which is Dr. Tracy Smith. She is a chiropractor, she's a doTERRA diamond, and she's been using essential oils for over eight years. And she's just gonna kind of give us um, a great intro to the science behind essential oils. And we're gonna keep going on this great journey to learn more about the science behind these wonderful, amazing healing plants from the earth. So Tracy, take it away. Thank you, Carrie. I'm really excited to share with you guys tonight. We're gonna get to the graphic that you see here on your screen in just a minute, but uh, first we're gonna talk about a few other things. So um, I work a lot with healthcare providers and one thing that I have become really aware of over the past eight years is that there is not a lot of information and therefore there's not a lot of knowledge surrounding the science of essential oils. So most people quite literally don't know that there is a science to essential oils. And one of my favorite aspects of essential oils is the science of the chemistry. So I love the chemistry of essential oils. I love how we can show why essential oils interact therapeutically with our bodies and our systems on a cellular level. I think this is such a amazing topic and one I really enjoy teaching about. So the unique chemical makeup of each essential oil is what gives them the ability to affect the body systems. And by understanding the fundamentals of oil chemistry, you can begin to classify oils by their chemical properties. And this helps us to understand and learn which oils have application and value in different situations. So we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into the chemical makeup of essential oils. Essential oils can be made up of anywhere between one and a thousand different compounds with different chemical identities. The different compounds in an essential oil are known as constituents. And an essential oil's aroma and the health benefits that it offers are both determinate on the chemical constituents. So Carrie, I'm gonna have you put that slide back up. And this is a very basic breakdown of how the categorization, categorization goes. So first essential oils can be broken down into two main types of aromatic molecules known as terpenes. They can be caught, broken down into monoterpenes and sesquiterpenes. Now there is a third group, but seldom do essential oils fall into that third group. So we're gonna focus on the monoterpenes and the sesquiterpenes. So they're then further categorized by functional group. There are more than 20 different functional groups in organic chemistry, but there are only eight main functional groups found in essential oils. So the functional groups in essential oils are alcohols, aldehydes, alkenes, ketones, esters, uh, ethers, phenols, and phenol proteins. From there, we break them down into content, uh, chemical constituents. So let me take you through a couple examples here. Um, monoterpene and sesquiterpene alkenes are well known by their antioxidant properties. So let's take a look at an oil that's primarily made up of the functional group alkene. So let's go to the next slide, Carrie. So this is black pepper. I love this image because it gives us a really great 
idea of the chemical breakdown of black pepper. And then it also gives us a really clear indication of this concept of different chemical constituents affecting different body systems. So we see, first of all, that black pepper um, is provides an antioxidant support, which we just talked about. The mono and sesquiterpene alkyl alkenes have that antioxidant property and they support healthy circulation and aids in digestion enhances food flavors and it, uh, we can diffuse them to soothe anxious feelings. They're gonna affect the nervous, cardiovascular and digestive systems. Now, if you look at those two pie graphs there, what we're seeing first of all is the carbon backbone, the terpenes they're broken down to and what percentage. So they're monoterpene and sesquiterpene. And then the functional group specifically is the alkenes. Those alkenes make up the vast majority of the breakdown of the um, functional groups of black pepper. And then we go to the next step, which is the main chemical constituents. We are uh, up to 46% beta carophylline, 25% up to limonene, up to 23% samine, 20% beta pinene, and 20% alpha pinene. And then we've got a little bit left with a delta 3 carotene. So this is black pepper and it gives us a really great uh, idea of what the chemistry of this specific oil is. If we go to the next slide, this gives us a good indication or a good idea of what beta caryophylline looks like when we break it down or we start to further analyze. So we talked about that black pepper makes, can be made up of as much as 46% beta caryophylline. So what does that mean? First of all, we see that the structural classification is the sesquiterpene alkenes. And then we see those benefits, what we already talked about. The soothing of skin and tissues. These are some indications of beta caryophylline or some benefits of beta caryophylline. We've got the soothing of the skin and the tissues, reducing appearance of blemishes, healthy inflammatory response, strong antioxidant, and supporting the digestive and circulatory system. So what we're able to do in this example is that if we know that we are trying to affect any of these benefits, we want to get any of these benefits from an essential oil, we can turn to that next column and see, okay, if we're really needing to have a um, support, strong antioxidant support in the body or a really healthy inflammatory response, which oils are going to be highly uh, percentage of beta caryophylline. And what we see here is that copaiba, our doTERRA's copaiba is anywhere from 45 to 65% beta caryophylline. Wow, that is really amazing. And then one step, if we can't get our hands on copaiba, um, our next step would be up to 46% black pepper beta caryophylline. These are really awesome um, statistics for us to look at and be able to see broken down because it gives us a really great idea of what essential oils we can turn to in order to have what effect on our body based on the chemistry, the chemical constituents. I wanna give you guys one more example before I finish up. So the next slide is gonna show us the example of lavender oil. So once again, we see it's mostly made up of monoterpenes and sesquiterpenes. There is a little bit of that other group we talked about, but vast majority monoterpene, sesquiterpene. And then we see that this oil has a much broader chemical profile than uh, the black pepper that we just talked about. This is lavender and we have primarily made up of esters, alkenes, and alcohols. But we're going to, and then our main chemical constituents, linol, linol acetate, linolol, and then osamine. I am really, I always tell people I'm horrible at pronouncing the chemical names. I know what they are, but I'm like horrible at pronunciation. So forgive me. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look now at this um, main chemical constituent found in the functional group of ester. So let's look at that next slide there. So linol acetate is considered to be in the ester group. So this has a calming aroma, surface cleansing properties, supports relaxation of smooth muscles, supports heart and cardiovascular health, 
promotes gastrointestinal health and immune function, soothing and calming effect on the nervous system. So what we can look at here is we've got four different oils that we can choose from that give us a really, really high amount or percentage of linalool acetate so we can have this effect or these um, effects on the body. Clary say, sage is up to 75%, pettigrain 65%, lavender up to 45% and bergamot up to 45%. So if you're trying to have this impact on the body, any of those listed on the left-hand side, by addressing or using an essential oil that's high in the chemical constituent linalool acetate, these are the four oils that you're best going to be able to turn to. They give you a really great example of some awesome essential oils. Um, and, and I just think that the most amazing thing about oils is their chemistry and how we're able to just really see how we're gonna affect the body on a cellular level by addressing the chemistry. So Carrie, anything else you want me to talk about? No, that's great. Thank you so much. This is a great introduction and um it kind of took me back to my um pre-pharmacy days when we yeah, were doing a chem right <laughs> i really um, liked it i don't know i just liked all the little puzzle it's like a little puzzle that you put together absolutely so thank you tracy for sharing yeah. that with us and yeah. you know i wanted to just mention those of you that are attending if you have questions you can definitely put them in the chat and maybe after each one of us presents we can sort of man the chat just to see if we could answer any of those questions if you guys don't mind doing that. All right, well, I'm gonna introduce myself. <laughs> My name's Carrie again, and um, I am a pharmacist. I'm an integrated health practitioner, and I'm a blue diamond with doTERRA. Um, I've been using oils for about eight and a half years, and um, I want to talk a little bit from a pharmacy perspective, because obviously I am a pharmacist. I worked in the pharmacy field ever since I was 16. And mm -hmm. um, I think it's interesting to see the difference between uh, essential oils and maybe modern medicines and kind of how it really did start with nature if when we think about uh, prescription medications. And so I have some listed over here, which I think is really interesting. Um, aspirin from willow bark, um, digoxin comes from foxglove plant, quinine comes from a bark of a tree, and then morphine comes from um, opium poppy. And so I, I just think it's so interesting how that's exactly where, where they go, right? Scientists go to nature because nature has amazing, amazing benefits. And so I wanted to talk a little bit and kind of look, um, if we look at the essential oil, essential oils through a lens of a conventional approach, um, or should I say more of a modern approach, we're kind of directed toward pharmacology. And by definition, pharmacology is the science of drugs, including their origin or composition, pharmacokinetics, you know, all these scientific terms, right? But it kind of makes up um, their origin a lot of times. So I want to talk about that a little bit in the process. And so, you know, when we think about pharmacology, and that's really what uh, we're known, you know, the medical field, you know, for as far as um, coming up with different drugs from nature and bringing through the process and bringing them to market so that you and I could take them if needed. And so the reason why pharmacology can't demonstrate essential oil effective, uh, efficacy, I wanted to talk a little bit about that process. So the process includes identifying one active ingredient and connecting it to a specific outcome. That's exactly how they would go through the process to bring a drug to market. And so for you know why this is difficult with an essential oil is because it's hard to, to take one specific part of an essential oil and make it have the same effect as the entire plant would have. And um, doTERRA actually did a, a study on this whenever they took linalool, which is a very calming compound in lavender. And we're gonna hear even more about lavender from Eliza at, at the very end. And she's got some great studies for us, but it's a very effective compound. And they took that the linalool and they studied it by itself. They studied lavender as a whole. And they also studied the synthetic versions of both of those. And what they found was that nothing compares to the whole unadulterated essential oil with many compounds. Like Tracy just mentioned, um, there's many different compounds in every single essential oil, and that's what makes them very unique. But that's also what is has sort of been a hindrance when you think about coming from a pharmacy and a sort of a conventional approach is 
that's how exactly how they come up with a medication is they take one active ingredient and they have to prove over and over and over again that it's consistent, that it has this one effect. And that's how you get this one active ingredient. And we know that medications can be very helpful if needed, but um, we also are, are learning and we're teaching you tonight how essential oils can be, you know, as effective, if not more in certain situations. But let's go back to kind of this process. I'm just I'm kind of showing you the difference here and sort of why sometimes essential oils maybe have, have not yet made it to um, your doctor is telling you to use them, which we, we do have someone here tonight that are, but sometimes these processes kind of trip us up. So the first is whenever they're bringing a drug to market, the experiment um, has to connect a specific substance to a specific event. And the second thing is that um, you have to uh, expect the results of the experiment to fit into a larger narrative, which describes a mechanism of action, right? You have to have that when you have a medication. And so, for instance, linalool acts as a sedative because it has it, it decreases irritability of the central nervous system. So that's one way that lavender can work, but it's sort of hard to have the consistency and have the time and the effort that it takes to, to identify each constituent from an essential oil. So I wanted to kind of um, tell you the process of how, how this works. So the dilemma, as far as the pharmacology cannot demonstrate essential oil efficacy because essential oils are so complex because they have more than one active ingredient and they have a lot of different constituents that can work in different ways. But the way that uh, pharmacology has worked primarily is from a reductionistic uh, point of view. And that just means they have to take that one specific part of an essential, of, a, of something in nature, excuse me, and synthesize it to make a, a drug and bring it to market. And so, um, so for instance, using lavender for burns um, is, a, is a classic example of something that a lot of us on this webinar probably have used, and we know it's very effective. But um, since lavender, it is hard to find that one active ingredient that mimics the effect of the whole oil, that's kind of why we see this um, uh, dilemma as far as we, we don't see it prescribed as much because it doesn't follow the same, same guidelines as uh, an, a drug does. So that was one thing I wanted to, to kind of help you guys to see because sometimes it's hard to say, okay, well, why, why aren't these things happening at a faster rate possibly? Because we see the effects of them if, if um, you guys have used essential oils before and something like lavender is, is very popular. Um, you know, if you've used any essential oils, you probably use that one and it is very effective, but these are some of the reasons. I also wanted to touch on the fact of how they work and how they interact with the cell. And Tracy already mentioned some of the different chemical constituents and, and their different effectiveness and then all the alcohols and all that kind of great information. I think that was really great that she went over that because now you can look at a, a chemical constituent or group and see, you know, if you want calming, you look for this, right? I, I like that she went over that. But as far as interaction with membrane receptors, this is exactly how essential oils work. This is how um, pharmaceutical drugs can work too, right? You have that one active ingredient that fit, fits one type of receptor on the cell. But what's really unique about essential oils is they do have that really complex chemistry that can interact with a lot of different receptors on a lot of different cells. And so you might use an essential oil for one reason, but you're going to get a lot of other different responses in the body from that one oil because it has so many constituents. So all of our bodily processes are run at a cellular level. Anything that happens always starts at a cellular level. And again, this is the way pharmaceutical medications work as well. And there's only, there, there's the one way that that medication can work. And sometimes when we synthesize something from nature, like one ingredient, it can make it, uh, obviously it makes it stronger but you lose a lot of the effectiveness of that plant as a whole because you're taking that one ingredient. And so essential oil influence the activity of the cell in two different ways. First off, it can act as a substrate, kind of like a bridge to trigger an activity to make, to make our body do something, right? That all starts at the cellular level, but then it kind of creates this cascade effect. And then secondly, it can modify the expression. And that kind of leads us into our next um, speaker and our next kind of topic, and that is epigenetics. 
And so I'm going to introduce to you my sister, um, Julie Davies. She's a nurse practitioner. She's a doTERRA diamond. She's been using oils for about two weeks, shy of what I have, right? <laughs> we kind of started at the same time. I love that. We get to learn together. And um, she specializes in gut health. So she is going to talk to us tonight about epigenetics. So Julie. Thank you, Carrie. Yes, uh, I'm thankful to you always for introducing me um, to these oils. And I'm excited to talk about epigenetics. Um, this is something that is kind of a new emerging field. We learned about it. Those of you who went to convention or maybe, you know, watched some of the recordings, uh, learned a little bit about epigenetics. So epigenetics is the study of how our behaviors and our environment can cause changes that affect the way that our genes work, which is pretty cool, right? Because if you're like me, you just have always thought, well, your genes are your genes, you know, we really can't affect much of that, right? So unlike genetic changes, epigenetic changes are reversible and they don't actually change your DNA sequence, but they can change how your body reads the DNA sequence. Okay, so I'm going to kind of dive into this. Ho hopefully it'll help understand, help you understand it a little bit better. So we know that the type of lifestyle that we live affects our overall well-being. I think, you know, those of you, everyone that's on this, this webinar, that's probably why you're, why you're on here, because you want to learn more about how to have overall better health, right? So from nutrition to exercise to supplementation to sleep to stress levels, all of that really matters and has either a positive or a negative impact on our health. We would probably all agree with that. But have you ever considered that the lifestyle and the habits of your parents, of your grandparents, of even your great grandparents could actually affect the way that your genes express? This is really cool. So this, of course, how your genes express will affect your overall well-being. So the actions that we take now ourselves greatly influence not only our own genetic coding, but may even have implications for our children and their children. And that's really the whole concept behind epigenetics. Okay, so let's go a little bit deeper, okay? We know that we inherit DNA from our parents, and that's like our own special blueprint, right? If you think of it that way. And that determines how our body is going to grow, develop, live. It's like your foundation, right? Your DNA is kind of your foundation, your unique blueprint. So genetics really isn't just a series of these fixed strands of self-replicating DNA that's passed down from generation to generation. Yes, it is the foundation of who you are. That is what, you know, genetics set the foundation, but lifestyle is actually what determines who you become. So I want you to kind of think about that as we continue um, to talk about this. You inherit from your parents this fixed blueprint for building and really kind of fundamentally maintaining who you are. But did you know that 99% of your genes are actually shared by all of humanity? Did you know that? But it's actually the difference in the remaining 0.1% that is the result of mutations, of errors in your DNA sequence that actually make all the difference. It's that 0.1% that actually makes all of the difference. So this happens when cells divide, they make a copy of their genome. So I wanna give you an example of this so we can kind of make it practical. Think about this, like copying your grandma's cookie recipe, okay? Let's say you want this recipe. It's amazing. It's perfect every time. So you take out a piece of paper. You're going to copy down this recipe. And of course, you want to get it exact word for word. I mean, every, every ingredient has to be precise and exact, right? But in the process of copying this down, you accidentally change the amount of salt from one teaspoon to one tablespoon. Well, the cookies probably aren't going to taste like grandma's, right? They're not going to be the same. I can vouch for that. I've definitely put too much salt in stuff. Does not taste the same. <laughs> okay. So this is the same thing. Our cells can actually make mistakes like this. And this mutation or this alteration is what makes you genetically unique. So remember, I said 99.9% .9 of genes are shared by all of humanity. It's that 0.1% that actually makes you unique. 
you unique, sorry. Um, and so epigenetics deals with how the genes are actually expressed. So let's talk for a minute about genetic expression. Genetic expression is the process by which those instructions in our DNA are converted into a protein, which is kind of like the functional product, okay? Think of this like the cookie as the final product, okay? In the example that I gave you. So gene expression allows a cell to respond to its environment and to adapt to it. So it acts like a light or a dimmer on a switch, okay? To control when and how much proteins are made. So epigenetics involves changes in gene activity without actually changing the DNA sequence. Remember, it's just about the expression of the genes. It's not about changing the DNA sequence. So let me give you another example. Let's, oh, I'm sorry, Carrie, I hadn't been telling you to advance the slides, but you did it perfectly. Sorry about that. No, go back to the, go back to the other one. I'm sorry. I was totally forgetting about the slides. Um, okay, so let me give you an example of a light bulb. Okay, a light bulb represents your gene. Okay, it has the capacity to produce light, but it won't do that without a signal from a switch. You know, you turn on the light switch. The signal, the switch is your lifestyle. Think of it that way. Okay, light bulb, turn on the switch. The switch is your lifestyle. So you can turn it up or you can turn it down, kind of like a dimmer switch, right? You can turn it on or you can turn it off. So epigenetics doesn't, again, change our DNA. It determines what genes are expressed and when, okay? Kind of like the light switch. Yeah. So decisions like how you fuel your body, um, how you move your body, how you rest your body, and things in the environment, substances that we're exposed to, they can really have long-lasting effects and also inherited or transmissible from parent to offspring influence on how you look, how you feel, and really every aspect of your health, okay? So while the science of epigenetics, you know, can seem kind of complicated, the function of the gene is actually really simple. Genes are either on or off, and they can be turned up, upregulated, or they can be turned down, which is downregulated, okay? And that's where the, the things that we do in our lifestyle make a big difference. So there's been some cool discoveries in epigenetics. Um, a couple of things you'll see here um, on, this, on this slide here. What you eat as an infant can influence your metabolic health, so really important what we're feeding our kids. Supplementation may permanently alter your cellular health which is pretty cool. I mean, we talk a lot about cellular health when we talk about things like lifelong vitality pack. Um, exercise and nutrition habits can affect the cognitive development of your future children, which is really cool. Now, if Carrie, if you'll go to the next slide, we'll talk about, I'll kind of wrap up with what does this mean in terms of essential oils? So epigenetics and essential oils, research is suggesting that the regular use of essential oils may positively influence epigenetics. Okay, again, this is, this is new emerging research and there will be much more of it to come in the future. But essential oils can positively influence the expression of genes in several systems in the body. They have found that it affects the genes in the cardiovascular system, the respiratory system, the lymphatics, the immune system, and the nervous system. And if you've been using essential oils for any length of time, or maybe you're just learning about them, we already know that they work to maintain homeostasis in the body or balance within the body. So this makes sense, right? That they could affect these genes uh, in our body. So maybe you're already using some oils aromatically to promote a calm environment in your home. We were actually talking about that when we first jumped on the webinar. Um, maybe you're using them topically to support healthy skin. Maybe you're using them internally to support various systems in the body, but you probably have never considered that using them in an acute sense, you're using them for specific reasons, can actually have long-term effects and maybe even fundamentally change who you are through epigenetics, which is pretty cool. So at doTERRA, doTERRA scientists have used molecular biology to see how the essential oils can influence the expression of proteins 
which are the molecules that are responsible for most of our cellular action. So now I wanna kind of give you some specific examples of this with the oils that I have listed here um, on the slide. So let's talk about helichrysum. Maybe you're applying helichrysum as part of your daily skincare routine. Consider that doing that may also affect not only your skin, but your hair and your nails. Citrus oils. We know that citrus oils help with healthy immune function. Grapefruit was actually found to aid in healthy gene expression in the immune system. Oregano. Now you may not know this about oregano. We know lots of oregano is, is, is wonderful, but maybe you didn't know that oregano can be used to support healthy respiratory function when taken internally. And research has found that oregano positively affects gene expression in the respiratory system. On guard, we all love on guard uh, for its immune support. So on guard was found to support healthy immune expression in those genes um, in the immune system and how well your body really responds to threats. Frankincense, the king of oils. We mentioned frankincense and we're gonna learn uh, more about frankincense in just a minute. Frankincense was found to support healthy gene expression in not only the immune system, but the inflammatory system and the skin. And then DDR Prime. DDR Prime, as you may know, is a blend of essential oils, and it was found to support healthy gene expression in the immune system and in the uh, inflammatory system. So again, this is sort of a newer area um, of science. doTERRA is continuing to do more and more research on this, so stay tuned. I'm sure we'll be sharing much more as the information um, is provided to us, but it's, it's really exciting thinking that um, you know, we do, we do have, can play a part. Our lifestyle we know matters, but it matters even more than maybe we ever thought that it did. Um, so with that, um, I, I'm, I'm going to turn it over back over to you, Carrie, so we can hear, um, from our last two speakers, which I'm really excited about. Yeah. Thank you, Julie. I love hearing about epigenetics. I just think it's fascinating. And this is literally just the, we're scratching the surface, even just about what we know as a whole. And I, I love that every time we go to convention and, and learn more about epigenetics, I'm always so excited about the possibilities that we just, you know, we're learning more and more about it. So thank you for that. All right, so um, next, our speaker is Dr. Tim Sachs. Um, he is a current practicing physician for over 40 years. He studied pharmacology and toxicology pretty extensively. He's written a few papers on these as well. And he is relatively new to essential oils, but he's been using natural remedies for many, many years. And so um, uh, Dr. Sachs is going to talk to us a little bit today about frankincense and how he's used it on some of his patients and um, just a little bit, we're going to learn more about a, an oil that is so amazing. So I can't wait to hear what you have to share, Dr. Sachs. Thank you uh, very much. And, and thank you all for joining this uh, webinar. Um, I've been practicing as a physician for over 40 years. I come from West Virginia and in Appalachia for many years, uh, people used herbal remedies and I got started with the herbal remedies. My my main concern using them was their purity. Um, and I found one lady who was very uh, obsessive compulsive on how she collected them because she wanted to make sure that they were pure. And one of the things that impressed me most when I got interested in uh, the doTERRA uh, essential oils is how they ensure the purity of these oils so you know exactly what you're getting. And, and with that, uh, when you find an oil like frankincense that has been around for close to 3,500 years, it's been used. It was first mentioned about 1500 BC um, in its use. Uh, Pliny uh, from ancient times used it as a um, way to block the effects of poison hemlock. Uh, and then we have in the, uh, the Bible, the uh, Magi uh, bringing gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Well, why, why would they bring frankincense and myrrh? And if you look at it, it was probably more valuable at that time than the gold that they brought. 
Uh, and one of the uses was topically, uh, it uh, had anti-inflammatory, antibacterial properties. Uh, so to help block infant death, which was very high at that time, uh, the, these were um, very essential oils and things that uh, the Christ child could use. Um, and that's why we, we see that uh, the, the Magi bringing the gold and, and the uh, myrrh. Now, it's also interesting if you study uh, the combinations, there are several good studies that show that combining uh, frankincense and myrrh, uh, that they interact and they become more, more potent. Um, and and uh, if you're interested in that, uh, Google it. There are several very good studies uh, that talk about that. So let's look specifically at frankincense. It comes from the Boswella tree. And in ancient times, it was uh, considered Boswellic acid, uh, which is made up of uh, the monoterpenes and the susquiterpenes. There are five different Boswellian trees or, or subtypes of the Boswellian tree. Uh, and they all have a little bit different constituents uh, in them. The way that they get the frankincense is that they cut the tree and then it the sap comes out and forms a resin. Um, we all sort of have touched pine trees and pine stuff and we get that goo on our hands that doesn't want to come off. Well, that's what frankincense is then harvested that way. The unfortunate thing is that there has been over harvesting and another thing that I have to give props to doTERRA is that they monitor this very, very carefully to make sure that the trees that they get their frankincense from are not over harvested. Uh, if you do over harvest it, uh, the trees don't produce the seeds uh, and they would eventually die out. Uh, so we have to be very, very careful uh, how it's collected uh, to ensure its purity also. Uh, as I said, it's a combination of monoterpenes and sesquiterpenes, um, and these are then purified by doTERRA uh, so that you know exactly uh, what you're, you're getting. And if you actually look on the bottle, it's very clear that you have per drop 60 milligrams of doTERRA, so you know exactly what you're getting. And in medicine, it's very important to know that so that you don't uh, make mistakes. So what is frankincense used for now? I mean, in antiquity, it was used for skin, skin tumors, ulcers, especially in the mouth, for fever. It was also noted to be good for breathing. And it was used as an incense to uh, improve the odors around things, but it also was found to improve breathing. Uh, it's a very pleasant smell uh, when it's diffused, and that pleasant smell would give people a sense of well-being just like other uh, essential oils do. Now, after the 3,500 years of using it, we find that it has many very, very potent uses um, it's found to be uh, anti-inflammatory. Uh, it decreases pro-inflammatory markers such as a, a C-reactive protein. It acts very much like a COX-1 inhibitor in the body. And that may be where its anti-ulcer effects uh, come from. It's an anti-tumor. It has anti-tumor effects. Uh, it inhibits cell growth in tumors and it increases cell death in tumors. It's been used in breast cancer, prostate cancer, pancreatic cancer, uh, colon cancer, leukemias, and it's been very useful in brain cancers, uh, especially gliomas or glioblastomas. Uh, and they've, they've done a lot of study there where it uh, inhibits the topoisomerase uh, one and the two alpha and this increases cell death, but it also uh, has been noted in those tumors uh, through scans 
to decrease the peritumor inflammation and edema. So very much like a steroid, uh, it improves uh, the, these people's quality of life. It's also been used in asthma. It's anti-inflammatory effects, uh, improved breathing. Uh, it's got analgesic effects. Uh, it inhibits leukocyte. Uh, if you froze. <laughs> Maybe he'll be back with us in just a minute. If you guys have any questions, I know that um, they're being answered by the wonderful ladies, the other panelists, so make sure you ask those in the chat. Well, I'm not sure how long we should wait on them. I know they had a a bad Wi-Fi connection. Okay, so they live out in the boonies. Okay, he's dropped off. So I'm just going to go ahead. If he comes back, he can definitely finish sharing um, all that um, he had about frankincense, which um, I love hearing all that information, um, just about all the cancer research that is out there on frankincense. You should definitely um, go look that up for yourself and read about it. It's pretty amazing. But I'm going to go on to our last presenter tonight, Miss Eliza Coat. Um, she's a nurse practitioner, a certified wellness practitioner at Oterra Diamond. Um, she's been using essential oils for over seven years and she specializes in gut health. Like this, like and Dr. Sachs is actually back with us. I'm um, back on. Okay. <laughs> we're, we're gonna, Can we're I gonna... just add, add yeah, one, sure. one thing? And I feel like one of those television commercials now that, um, you know, side effects and things like that. Uh, frankincense has very low side effects. Uh, obviously, if you're allergic to any of the constituents, uh, you shouldn't take it. But some people rubbing it on their skin will have some uh, reaction to the skin. And also use it in caution with people who are on Coumadin or Warfarin. Um, it doesn't work like aspirin. It, it's not protein bound, but there is some inhibition cytochrome P450 pathway with Warfarin. Um, and also um, possibly with the COX-1 inhibition, there may be some interactions there too. So people on Warfarin need to follow their uh, INR very carefully with that. Uh, and that's basically what I had to say tonight and I'll wait for questions. Thank you so much. Um, we are thankful that you, you shared with us. And I know that you've seen a lot of these um, these great benefits, even in your patients. And so I'm glad that you were able to share with us on frankincense. And if you do have a question specifically for Dr. Sachs, just make sure you put it in the chat. And um, I, I'm also, at the um, whenever I send out the recording to all that have registered, I'm gonna send the um, email addresses of all the panelists, just in case you had a specific question that did not get answered. So thank you, Dr. Sachs. Um, and and uh, Ms. McCote, I already, <laughs> already um, gave your little rundown. So if you want to just jump right in and, and let's talk about some studies. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> awesome. You Thanks, Carrie, so much, yeah. you guys. I'm so excited to be here. Um, I love, love, love the science of our body and the science of essential oils. And I just feel honored to follow Dr. Sachs because... Um, it's really rare and unique these days to have a physician that is so well-versed, not only in modern medicine, but also in holistic medicine. And I just have to say for one, as a nurse practitioner, I'm so grateful to see a medical doctor on here, um, touting, you know, the benefits of both. And, um, so I'm learning stuff too, um, every day. And I love that. Thank you, Dr. Sachs. Um, so you can go to the next slide. So. I want to take and kind of compound on what everybody has presented and maybe give you a little bit of application to this. Um, I, for one, was really floored when I started um, studying plant-based therapies like essential oils. Um, number one, why didn't I learn about it in school? Because there's so many applications. I was really 
annoyed that I paid $85,000 for a graduate school education and wasn't taught about it. Not Julie, who enrolled me and was also my graduate school instructor. I'm eternally grateful to her. Um, but number two, just in all of the applications that people can have um, and at the science and the studies that actually exist out there. And so um, I feel really lucky this year because I got to experience the lavender fields in Provence during blooming. And um, it's absolutely incredible because the air actually smells like lavender. And um, I was also in Switzerland and you know how this is, you know about something, you say something all the time. We say like lavender is the Swiss army knife of oils, right? We're just used to saying that phrase and maybe it loses its meaning because we're used to saying it all the time mm -hmm. and we just don't think about it. And so I actually was able to go to Switzerland and with my family and bought my son his first Swiss army knife. And we're like pulling it out the first night. And I was like, oh my gosh, there's like 5,000 little applications on the Swiss army knife. You can open a can with it. You can cut your nails with it. You could do all these different things. And then I don't know why it took that application clicking for me in my brain. Like, oh yes, lavender. This is why we use that term because it has so many applications. And I think sort of the reputation of lavender um, is really underscored, right? We really just think about lavender as like, oh, a perfume or a relaxant, or it like helps you be calm, right? But what I'm gonna highlight tonight, and please know this is just the tip of the iceberg in some of the research on lavender. Um, I obviously did not have enough time to highlight everything, but I just wanna highlight for you what a truly medicinal oil this is um, and why it's so powerful. You can go to the next slide, thanks. Um, so we're gonna talk about some of the top things that lavender is very well studied for. Um, and the one thing that I wanna start with is um, really just understanding the constituents, like, uh, and this is a study that is done by, done by the University of Mississippi with doTERRA lavender specifically. So we have about five studies that are gonna be published with that partnership. Um, and the reason why they're partnering with doTERRA is because doTERRA was able to reproduce the same quality of oil over and over and over again in their studies. And that was something they had not found. Um, so really speaking to the quality and of course, how important it is. Um, and so this is really what that study backs up, basically saying every time they tested that oil, it was authenticated, validated, replicated, right? They got the same results over and over and over, meaning that the quality was longstanding from batch to batch. And that's just really important. Number one, talking about where we get our source from, right? This is why we talk about quality so much in doTERRA. What you're going to get off the shelf somewhere else is not going to be something like this. And so that is very, very important. And now we have the data to back that up, right? Okay, next slide. So that's foundational and really cool. More studies coming out from lavender. And so we have the primary chemical constituents in lavender as you've heard other professionals on here talk about and so eloquently describe um, is linalool acetate and linalool. Um, linalool being an alcohol group, you can see that OH, that's an alcohol group up there. Um, you can go to the next slide. Thanks. Okay, so skin, skin, skin. So the whole reason why we talk about lavender for bug bites for wounds, for burns, whether it be sunburn or kitchen burns, um, is because there is a lot of data to back up how lavender actually affects healing of the tissues. This is a study from the Journal of Art Alternative Complementary Medicine. Um, and they actually did a review. So when they do a review, if you're not familiar with this, they take a body of evidence of studies on wounds and lavender, and they actually pick out the ones that are most relevant and most important. And they kind of make a conclusion based on all those studies, right? And so what they found basically is saying, we don't even have to replicate another their trial. They had seven clinical trials that were on humans that they included five on animals and two in vitro. Um, and what they found is that there is a therapeutic benefit of lavender essential oil and wound healing. I think some of the hardest thing that we're up against, especially in America, not so much in other countries, is that medical professionals will say there's no science behind that, or that's just 
you know, not validated or et cetera, et cetera. And it actually is. Most people just don't know the data is out there. And so this is really important when you find reviews um, because it's not just like one measly study with 10 people in it or a rat study, right? Even though rat studies really are important because they set the stage for human studies. Um, anyway, so that's a review and that's just an overarching study saying basically we reviewed all these studies and it's effective. Uh, okay, next slide. Awesome, thanks. So speaking of rats, this is cool because rats help us get down to the cellular level of what's actually happening. Why does it help heal wounds? Why is that so important? Um, and so when you look at this study, what they looked at with rats, they actually created wounds. Um, and they actually did, um, in the past, I've been hesitant to do direct topical application of essential oils to open wounds. Um, but actually in this study, this backs up that we can do that and the tissues can tolerate it. Um, probably diluted would be safest. Topical application of lavender, um, induced expression of collagen as we now all start to put it all over our face for those of us that are over the age of 40, right? Um, expressive collagen, right? We want that, we want collagen. It helps our skin be kind of puffy, right? And, and look youthful. Um, and collagen replacement, right? And these different types of wounds and different types of cells that were treated with a lavender oil. It was enhanced expression of TGF beta in wounds that were treated with lavender oil significantly as compared to the control, the ones that were not treated with it, right? Um, and so this suggests promotion of differentiation of fibroblasts. Fibroblasts is a, is a, a a cell that we see that comes to wounds to help heal it, knit it back together and to actually make it um, your skin again, <laughs> um, for lack of a better term. And it's very important for what we call wound contraction. Um, and that basically means just closure of the wound. And so literally this was accelerated when they used the lavender, meaning that it happened faster in those um, rats versus the ones that didn't have it. Okay, next uh, slide. Um, now, actually. So as I have done lots of research in the past on lavender and other essential oils, um, when I was doing my research the other day, um, a bunch of studies actually popped up on perineal um, repair related to using lavender. And a lot of times different practitioners will send people home um, with not only hormone creams, but iodine and things like that post episiotomy or after having a baby, if there's a tear in the perineum. Um, and there's actually quite a few studies Studies. This is just one of them. Um, and what they actually saw in this study, um, while there wasn't a difference in surgery site complications, there was a reduction in redness in the lavender group that was significantly less than the controls. And a couple of the other studies that I looked at, what actually was significantly better was the pain of the patient. So the discomfort of the patient um, in the postpartum phase with episiotomy or perineal tear. So that's pretty cool. So again, wound healing, right? In a really important phase for women. Okay, next. Okay, so now let's talk about nervous system. Um, you heard Carrie speak a little bit about that related to linalol earlier. Um, and this is really cool because how many times I always joke with people, like one of the worst things that can come into your office when you're a provider is like cough, headache, or just like nervous twitches, right? And the reason why is because the workup for those is like extensive. You're like random cough. You have to do like 50 different tests to get to the bottom of it, right? Same thing. People that have restless leg syndrome, um, twitches that are not essential, not things like that. But for those people that suffer from those things, this is an indication for supporting them with lavender and supporting the nervous system. Um, so, and we're going to talk just a little bit about the biological effects too, when we talk about some of the anxious feelings effects that it, it impacts, um, that it has anxiolytic, meaning it stops anxious feelings and antidepressant like effects. Um, we're actually due to the anti antagonism of something called the NMDA receptor. Um, and this is really important because this receptor is like the receptor of all receptors um, and it helps other receptors. So it's important to think about it that way. And the inhibition of CERT, which is like serotonin. Um, it's like a reuptake inhibitor basically um so basically keeping that serotonin in this in the receptor 
Um, and that helps with the central nervous system too. Um, and so um, what we look at is this, like the same way that it's effective for those anxious feelings, it's actually effective for the nervous system. Okay, next slide. Um, this is actually one of my favorite studies to tout about lavender. Um, if you've worked in healthcare for a long time, you understand the implications of people that are on psychotropic medications related to anxiety and depression. And um, it is vast and wide and people need a lot of it and they end up needing more and more and more. And so um, really without being too non-compliant, what I would say is we're in a crisis level of needing other tools in our tool baskets for people. Um, and this is just an awesome study because it's multi-centered, double-blinded, randomized controlled trial in humans um, where they looked at, there's a, a preparation in Europe called Selexin, which is actually internal lavender. Um, and what they looked at is um, 164 patients that had generalized anxiety disorder. Um, and they actually gave them 0.5 milligrams of lorazepam in one group and gave them um, 80 milligrams and 160 milligrams of selexin in the other group. 80 milligrams would be about a drop and a half. And um, 180 milligrams would be somewhere around three drops of lavender internally. And it was actually found to be just as effective for generalized anxiety disorder as the um, lorazepam group. And what was interesting that they found is that because it was less sedating, people were able, able to be more functional on a daily basis just using the selexin. So that was cool. Okay, next slide. Um, again, another study on selexin. And I just did this because this is a great reason why I... Um, tell people if you need a rescue remedy in your life, <laughs> in trauma, whatever it may be, adaptive capsules have lavender in them, serenity soft gels have lavender in them, and when in doubt, put two to four drops in a veggie cap or a shot of water and take it. Um, I had a horrible anxiety attack when I was pregnant with my third child. Um, and I didn't realize that my B vitamins were extremely low, like critically low. And so this was the first time I had had something like this happen to me. And I had a wonderful friend, thank goodness she used oils, um, and was on my team came over and literally just, I don't even know how many drops she put in cause she was shaking and she was like, worried she was had to call ER cause I couldn't breathe. And I mean, I just drank half the glass and within about 15 minutes, everything was calm. And so Again, I can't say this enough, especially in this anxiety ridden world that we've had in the last year and a half, fear, lots of fear, um, lots of trauma, um, people need support emotionally. And this is a great tool. Um, aromatically, there's tons and tons of studies on this too, but, um, you know, I'm a nurse practitioner. I want like internal 99% bioavailability effect. <laughs> and so I'm internal. And so in this study, same thing, what they found um, that there was, um, they used lorazepam as well, 0.5 milligrams. Um, and they actually had a placebo group for nothing. And then they had selexin and they did, they compared this actually with Paxil too in this group. Um, and looking at this, they also noted that the 160 milligrams of selexin was more effective than the 80, same thing. Um, but comparative efficacy with selexin, um, uh, with higher dose of lorazepam, not sure, right? We need more studies on that to, to understand for people that are on two, three, four milligrams, you know, maintenance doses sometimes. Um, okay, next slide. Okay, so let's talk about the anti-inflammatory effects. So we've talked about skin, wound healing. We've talked about anxious feelings. Um, now we're actually talking about the uh, inflammatory response. A lot of people don't really understand why we use lavender as a component for helping people with seasonal threats. Um, and here's some information why. And so um, it's actually very interesting. It has this anti edema edematogenic properties. And what that basically means is edema is swelling. Um, when there's inflammation, the tissues leak and you get edema and swelling and puffiness, right? So here we see some anti-inflammatory activity, um, both in topical treatment and orally. Um, and what they found actually is it affected prostanoids, pro-inflammatory cytokines. Almost everybody that has studied um, COVID and inflammation this year understands the term cytokines now and what that means um, and how that affects the inflammatory process. Nitric oxide also affected when you have an allergic response. It 
vasodilates things and makes the vessels get big and leaky and makes your tissues red and of course histamine. So we see lavender actually having an effect directly on histamine release. Um, so that's some of your science back up there for the anti-inflammatory and histamine response. And next one. Okay, so there's like 20 more studies I could have presented, but I think we've done enough here to show you like, okay, if you wanna go down this rabbit hole of lavender, um, just like Dr. Sack said, Google, PubMed, lavender essential oil and the condition you're looking for, or just do lavender essential oil and you'll see a plethora of data that you can kind of look through and understand. But basically, let's just wrap it up and say um, and analgesic, right? So also pain relieving, um, anti-convulsant properties. So supporting people with anti-convulsant, this is really important because a lot of times in modern medicine, this can be really challenging, um, to help support the body when they're dealing with convulsions, right? Um, and antidepressant, we see that by the biological activity of how it affects those very specific cells that relate to, um, our happy feelings and also our mood, um, antifungal effects, antihistamine. We've seen that now anti-infectious. I will say this. There are a lot of great studies on the antibacterial effects of lavender. It is not one of the top ones. Okay. But one of the cool studies that I had found long ago, because I do a lot of studies on the gut is what they actually were looking at in a study about gut microbiota and bacteria. Um, lavender was effective against some of the pathogenic bacteria, but what they noted about it is that it actually was able to be selective in understanding which ones were the good bacteria, the probiotics versus the bad bacteria. This is mind blowing to me. Here we have the connection of God made our bodies, God made the plants, they both work perfectly together and they're smart and they know how to help us in certain situations and they're intelligent, right? Um, so I just have always remembered that study and thought that was so cool. Uh, Anti-inflammatory, cardiotonic. I could have included a lot of articles related to um, helping people that need support with arrhythmias or um, difficulty with their heart rates. Um, and so those studies are typically aromatically regenerative. We see that in the womb healing, right? Um, and sedative. It actually is very helpful for sleep. Lots of aromatic studies in that the body. Um, so again, the picture of the Swiss Army knife. And now we connect all the dots. Um, if you're like me, I've been saying that saying for a long time, it's the Swiss Army knife of oils and like not really just connecting that analogy and how perfect it is. Um, and so go grab some lavender. Yes. Wow. I just, uh, my mind is blown once again. Thank you so much, Eliza. Um, I just love that you love to research and um, to, to give us all this information and uh, you know, I, I've experienced some of these things, but just seeing the studies and, and hearing the data is, is another. So I'm going to stop share on the screen and just say thank you all for joining us. That was an amazing packed hour of science. Um, I'm going to ask the other panelists, was there any questions that you saw that we needed to address before we kind of wrap up here? Julie, I think you were sort of manning the chat. Do you, um, is there? Um, there were a couple of questions. Um, let me just go back. Sorry, I'm just scrolling up. Um, there were quite a few about frankincense. Frankincense. Yeah. yeah. So how much frankincense do you recommend for cancer patients to start taking uh, in pill form with and without chemo? That was the question. Uh, Dr. Sachs, you are muted. Okay, I'm back again. All right, um, the the standard dose uh, is 250 to 500 milligrams. Uh, so that'd be uh, three three drops um, a day, uh, up to six drops a day uh, of the of the purified oil. Um, and, and again, it's important to know what you're actually using and to make sure that the product that you have uh, is, is pure, not just something off the shelf at Walmart or Kroger's or something like that. Yes, very good distinction there. <laughs> um, 
Awesome. Okay. The next question is, has there been a study on frankincense and rheumatoid arthritis? Anyone aware of a study involving rheumatoid arthritis and frankincense? I'm not aware of any specific study that was for rheumatoid arthritis. I'm sure it's out there because it does have very good inflammatory um, uh, properties. Um, and, uh, you know, again, uh, you can look it up, you can go through, there's a ton of information out there uh, to look at. Yes, definitely. PubMed is a good place um, to go to, um, you know, to search. What about other oils for cancer? That was another question. Any recommendations for other oils for cancer? The combination of uh, frankincense and myrrh has been used um, and uh, has shown some promise. Okay, wonderful. Um, <clears throat> several people asked, um, and I replied a couple of times about the recording. The recording will be available. Carrie will send that out to everyone that registered in an email. And then there was a question, would the slides for what well, says, I think it's for your presentation, Dr. Sachs. It says, were the slides for his, were the slides for his presentation? I'm not sure. Maybe I don't. I, I did not have slides for my presentation. Oh, oh okay. Okay. That's, that's what they were asking. Sorry. Um, I think that those were pretty much all of the. Yeah. Uh, oh, let's see. Here's one more. Sorry. Um, I have a friend with cancer, <clears throat> has an almost unbearable amount of pain, and meds haven't been helping. Is there something that I could recommend from doTERRA? So for pain with cancer? Well, there's several, several uh, of us tonight have talked about uh, the effects with lavender, the effects with the frankincense. They do have anti-inflammatory effects and may augment other uh, types of pain medicine. Uh, and I think would be, would be worth, worthwhile. One of the things with pain is that we do have a lot of anxiety about the pain and relieving the anxiety um, with lavender might be of a great benefit um, as well as using something like the frankincense, which has the uh, anti-inflammatory and it also decreases the swelling around um, the, the tumors. Thank you. Um, I think this is, we're just going to do this again. <laughs> There's just so much information to share and, and questions and things. And I just appreciate all of you sharing tonight and just giving of your time. And thank you guys, um, those that are attending for being on. I know I did get a question. I'm definitely going to send out the recording. You can share with anybody that you feel would benefit from this information. One more thing that I wanted to mention, um, Eliza and I are going to be sharing on another different webinar next Tuesday about sort of the way forward and how um, us as healthcare practitioners are using it to help patients and how you can earn an income from that and how you can really incorporate it into what you're doing. And so if that's of interest to you, I'm gonna send that out in the recording, with, with the recording, excuse me, that you can register for and, um, and join us next Tuesday if that's something that you are interested in. It, it, that's for anybody in doTERRA, it's not, it's not team specific, it's nothing like that, it's for, anyone that wants to join that as well. So I'll send that out with the recording and I just want to thank you guys again. And, and we'll definitely have to do this um, again later. Thank you all so much. Y'all have a great night. Bye everyone.